Welcome back, everyone, for day two of the Gender Equality Summit. Is anyone joining us for the first time today? One person, two, three, excellent. Well, welcome. You are in uh, for a great day of content, a great day of networking and engaging. The program today, like I said, at the end of yesterday, we tried to keep it a little bit lighter. We end a little bit earlier uh, because we know with these conferences, we try to say all the things and do all the things and it can, we really want people to leave feeling um, inspired and connected also with a, a deep awareness of the agenda going forward. And I think you heard that, that attempted balance in the keynote speakers um, last night, uh, but we are once again trying to balance that today. Um, so I'm Julia Anderson. I'm the CEO of the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health and CanWatch hosts the Equal Futures Network. Uh, and the summit is brought to you by, by both of us, I suppose, but really an initiative of the Equal Futures Network. So we're in for a, a great day. I wanna walk you just briefly uh, through the, what's expected today. There's one, there's a couple uh, pieces that are different than yesterday and I wanna make sure to highlight those things. Um, so I, I wanna first though recognize that this is uh, the land of the Algonquin nation uh, where for since the beginning of time, the Algonquin people have been here caring for their land, uh, laughing, living, loving, and playing on the land, engaging with neighbors and partners and friends. And it is through their resiliency that we have the great privilege of being here uh, today. Uh, and I hope that, that our program today does honor uh, to reconciliation to the path forward. And I think uh, you'll hear more about that in our opening for today, which I'll get to in just one second. So let me walk you through after uh, our morning keynote, uh, we will have concurrent sessions. So there'll be one session taking place here, uh, which is those rapid fire knowledge spotlights, as well as a panel uh, workshop that's happening. Uh, and then we will have, uh, uh, we'll grab some lunch at 11.45, a little bit earlier. The caveat about lunch, is even though it's a beautiful day, we are going to bring our lunches into this room and eat them here because the Minister for International uh, Cooperation, uh, Minister uh, Sajan will be here and will be doing a chat. Uh, we frame the chat out as four tough questions. I think it turned into four hot topics, uh, but I think it'll be really interesting. Uh, Chris Dandy is one of our board members and the ED of uh, Results Canada will be engaging in a fireside chat. So we're hosting that over lunch and we're hoping you'll eat your lunch and uh, participate in that um, because he has, uh, originally we didn't know if he'd be able to come and he really did want to be here. And I think it makes a nice connection between the, the what Canada wants to be uh, here domestically and what Canada wants to be uh, internationally. So please join us for that. Um, I'll also remind you that there's Wi-Fi passwords around, they're on the screens and at the registration desk. Uh, we have simultaneous interpretation. Please grab a headset. There will be content in both French and English. Uh, you can use our hashtags, uh, which are also up, will be up on the screen. Um, and we have this app uh, the glue, my glue up app that has the agenda. We are very disappointed to discover there's a technical glitch and it's making it so that you can't communicate with one another on the app, uh, which was a service that was supposed to be built into that. For that reason, you're going to receive an email following this uh, event at the end of today or tomorrow at some point, that's going to ask if you'd like to opt in to have your contact information shared. Um, so we can't take the emails like we used to and just share them out of all the conference attendees, uh, but we can ask you if you would like your email shared out and then we can share them out. So we're committed to doing that. So, you know, cause not everyone had their business cards um, ready to go because of the, the whole pandemic thing. So um, if you didn't have your business cards or you don't have business cards like myself or you forgot them like myself, um, this is a great way to exchange information and be able to connect with one another. It is now my great pleasure after that housekeeping to uh, introduce uh, Shanice 
uh, to you. We have had Shanice uh, speak at several of our events and it is such a privilege. I'm so excited to see you live. This is the first time we've actually met physically in person. Uh, so Shanice Indowabo Steele uh, is an Afro-Indigenous fat femme living and learning on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people and the dish with one spoon wampum. Shanice navigates the world as an Afro Anishinaabe Kwe, being black, native, queer, and fat in a world that says these things should not exist. I, I just, I love this bio. Um, a published writer, Shanice uses writing as an outlet to express her fears, joys, and dreams. She spent the last 10 years as an activist, facilitating workshops, creating curriculum, delivering training, and doing guest talks like this one on Black and Indigenous issues. She is the founder of the not-for-profit Asganan Project, working to educate racial, racialized and Indigenous people on their shared histories. We are so fortunate uh, that Shanice is here today to share her history and her story uh, with all of us. Please give a very warm welcome. Hello, everyone. Good morning, Mino Gajep. I'm going to introduce myself in my language first. So, Anin Bojo Buju, Shinis and Dishnakas, and Dobo Dago Nishnabemnang, Jijak and Dodem, Meiti and Nishnabe Makade Kwe, Edopakang Dunjaba, Minwa Nabising Dunjaba, Debenjane Nakuya, Anishnabek. So, hello, my name is Shinis Steele. My Anishinaabe name is Ndobo, which means to carry the ceremony. I'm Crane Clan, and I'm Afro-Indigenous. My family on my dad's side comes from a very tiny island called Karakou. It's off the coast of Grenada, and there's about 8,000 people there. And everyone knows who everyone is by your face. The first time I went to the island to visit my family, they said, you're a steel. You're from Leicester. I know who your family is. That's how small that community is. My mom is Métis and Anishinaabe, and we really grew up out on the land, specifically in Mississauga territory in the Kortha Lakes area. And I think really and truly, it's the most beautiful place in the world. I'm a little biased because I love it there. Um, but I grew up in Edopakong, and that word might sound a little familiar. It sounds like Etobako. Edopakong is the Anishinaabe word for that area, and it means the place of many trees. And I know when you go to Toronto now, it doesn't look like a place of many trees, it's concrete. But actually when my grandma grew up there, it still was a place of many trees. So she grew up still out on the land. And so her connection to Adopakong, Toronto, that area looks very different for her. But I love honoring that story because I think when we look around us in this modern day, right, it's hard to connect to the land sometimes. And as we're here on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people, it's hard to connect here sometimes too. I wanna ask how many people in this room are Algonquin? None, right? So when we talk about acknowledging the land that we're on and acknowledging that re re relationship of reconciliation, when you look around a room like this and there's not a single Algonquin person on their traditional territory, what does that mean, right? When we say look around us, we say who's not in the room, it has to be more than just looking around, right? Because we just did that right now. What does it mean to actually create space for the traditional people of these territories? What does it mean to have Algonquin folks in this space, sharing space with us? When we talk about learning on these lands, what does it mean to learn with them at the same time, not separate, but together? So I grew up, like I said, in Etobicoke, North York, Toronto, but I was born in Milton, Ontario, which is a small city outside of Toronto. It was small when I lived there, it's grown definitely now. But when I was there, it wasn't as diverse as it is now. And so growing up, I kind of felt out of place when I wasn't with my family. When I was on the land with my grandparents and spending time with my dad's family, I didn't feel like I didn't belong. In actuality, I have one cousin whose father is white and he's half native and he's blonde hair and blue eyes and he was the odd person growing up. Now imagine in Canada, a blonde haired blue eyed person is the odd person. But that's how I grew up in my family. And it wasn't until I went to school and I was spending time with other people that I realized I didn't look like everyone else. It wasn't until that first day when I walked into kindergarten and someone looked at me and said, you're brown, you can't play with us. 
And that was my first day of kindergarten. And that stayed with me. And when people ask me, Shanice, when did you start doing activism? It was that day. That day when I had to go home and speak up for myself to my mom, when my mom then called the school and I had to speak up again, that was the first day I did activism. And I think for a lot of racialized folks in Canada, indigenous, black, racialized, our activism starts from a very young age, right? That's the first time you become an activist. We think of activism as always taking to the streets and protesting, but it looks like different things. Decolonizing looks like different things. Creating that space in that classroom as a young Afro-Indigenous person was me decolonizing the space because I wasn't meant to be there, right? In the same way that a lot of people would say, I'm not meant to be here right now. So I was always looking for a sense of belonging. And when I moved to Toronto and I saw other indigenous and black people for the first time, I was shocked. I really believed that the only black people that I knew in Canada were my family. And the only indigenous people I knew were my family and the folks that I had met in those small areas. You know, when you're young, you don't think of the world as such a big place. It's very much right where you are. And so coming to Toronto and moving and taking trips to Quebec with my dad or taking trips to Ottawa or going to Fort Erie where I learned about Harriet Tubman for the first time. Those were the moments that I really started to feel a sense of belonging, right? Because community, that's what gives you a sense of belonging. When we talk about decolonizing spaces, it's about creating spaces for community. That's how we feel we belong. Racialized folks, indigenous folks, we talk all the time about walking into a room and you see another racialized person, the only other racialized person there and you nod. That's decolonizing. That's saying, hey, we're here and we belong here and we're gonna take up space and we're gonna acknowledge each other's existence in this space because other people will not. So as I got older, I started to really try to find my voice more and more. I wanted to create more space for myself. And during that time, it was a hard time. I had lost my uncle who I was very close to. He passed away when I was 14. And I feel like that really sent me in a tailspin. I became a very angry person. And during that anger, Unfortunately, I ended up being arrested. And I'm saying that, I'm standing here today and I'm saying I'm someone who was in the justice system. And through that experience, I got access to elders for the first real time living in Toronto. I grew up in the North End, a lot of indigenous support is uh, generated in the South, South part of Toronto, downtown. And ceremony saved my life. And I 100% stand on that. If I did not have access to elders, to ceremony, to being gifted my name and my colors, I probably wouldn't be here standing in front of you today. And there are so many other indigenous, Afro-Indigenous youth, racialized youth, who without their community, their access to their elders, to their culture, also wouldn't be standing here today. That's what helps us feel like we belong here. That's what helps us going to keep going, right? That sense of I'm seen and I'm heard and I have access to the things that I need to be successful in myself and my identity. So when I say I probably shouldn't be here today for a lot of people, I say that because when we think of indigenous youth and black youth, Right? We forget sometimes how much they're represented in some of the systems that oppress us. So indigenous youth make up 7% of the population, youth population in Canada. Yet we represent 36% of youth currently incarcerated. 36%, that's almost half of indigenous youth right now are currently incarcerated. I was one of those percentages. And to some people, I would have just been a percentage on a paper. I wouldn't be someone who's standing here keynote speaking for you today. I wouldn't be someone who went to the UN and was able to sp speak on the plenary floor, right? I would, I would just be a statistic on a piece of paper. In the same way that black youth 
now represent 21% of youth incarcerated in Ontario, 21%. How many Black and Indigenous youth could have been sitting here right now today with all of us that are now currently incarcerated, that don't have access to the elders and the community that I got access to, to be able to be here? Decolonizing has to look like more than just talking about it or putting indigenous and black authors on a reading list. It looks like getting that 36% and that 21% of black and indigenous youth out of the justice system. It looks like providing them with the same resources and supports that I got in order to be a part of my community in ways that were healthy for me. So when I'm thinking also about education, like I said, adding Black and Indigenous authors to reading lists, 20% of Black youth drop out of high school. And I almost was one of them. I remember being 15 years old and begging my mom to send me to boarding school. Begging, because I wanted better education. The high school that I went to was not meeting my needs. And the teachers were honest that they could not meet my needs with the supports that they had. And so I remember printing out all of these boarding schools for my mom. And I was like, mom, see, it's only $20,000 a year. Also, when you're 15, you don't understand money. So I was like, mom, it's only $20,000 a year. I don't understand why I can't go to boarding school. I want to learn fencing. Like, I want to learn these random things that I don't get to learn at my school. And of course, my mom could not afford $20,000 a year. Now, when you think of the fact that Indigenous learners on reserves receive their schools receive about five to seven thousand dollars less per student than off reserve schools. Those youth also can't attend boarding school. They also can't attend private school and the spaces where they will get that adequate education. Again, how many of them could be in this room with us right now? How many Black and Indigenous youth who have dropped out of school because the schools did not support their learning were not decolonizing in real ways that meant not just those lists, but actual representation through teachers, actual reconciliation through funding, right? How many of them could be in this room with us today? When we talk about representation also as a form of decolonizing, I think about how many Black and Indigenous people there have been on the federal le level representing us. The first Black woman to be elected in Canada was Rosemary Brown in 1975. The first Black woman to be put as a party leader wasn't until 2011. And when I think about that, that my grandmother left Trinidad as a dark skinned black woman to come to Canada to get support and resources to create a better life for her children. She left my dad in Trinidad when he was two years old and my uncle was nine months when she came to Canada to make a better life. And between 1973, when she came to 2011, there was not a black leader of a political party in Canada. So imagine you come to a country to make a better life for your family and you have no representation, no black person leading a federal party. And that was only an interim leader in 2011. The actual elected leader of a federal party didn't happen until 2020. The first indigenous woman to be elected was in 1988. So when we talk about representation as a form of decolonizing, what does it mean when Black and Indigenous voices aren't represented in the leadership of our parties? When they're not seen as people who can make change in Canada, a place that's supposed to be for everyone. When we talk about in places like Manitoba, and I believe it was 2019 where we had the first black woman elected as an MLA. My grandmother has been here for over 40 years. 
My mom and my family have been here for generations as indigenous people. Representation has to go past simply putting a face on a screen. Decolonizing has to be more than just putting a face on a screen. It has to be real change, right? When we talk about racism, racism is prejudice plus power. Black and indigenous and racialized people have to have access to the same power that we have all access to. And when I say power, I don't mean in the super colonial way, but I mean in the way in which that their voices are heard and they matter, that power, that power in the voice, that power in self. And it's hard to find that sometimes when you're not seen, when you're not supported. So I talked about that kind of rough earlier childhood and being arrested and where I was. And to be honest, even standing here now, I have a little bit of that imposter syndrome, right? That I think so many of us have. I've met people with like four or five degrees and they're still sitting, degrees and they're still sitting there being like, I don't know if I should be here right now. I don't know if I have a right to talk about this, right? That imposter syndrome, especially for racialized women and femme and queer folks. Right, this feeling that these systems, we know we're not created for us, that we do not belong, right? That feeling of not belonging. I was on the phone with my partner this morning and she was like, I don't know why you're worried. You do this all the time, like it's gonna be fine. But I was like, no, I'm so stressed. Like, I don't know if what I'm gonna say matters, right? I already started to do the work of the system, right? That's what these systems create is they start the groundwork and then they leave you alone. And then you start to do it to yourself, right? So decolonizing also starts with ourselves. It's reminding ourselves that we're powerful, that our voices matter in spaces like these. So even though I was really nervous this morning, I was as I was in my Uber after the first two canceled, I was in my Uber and I was like, Shanice, today's gonna be a great day. It's gonna be good. You know, you're a little stressed this morning, the Ubers didn't help, but today's gonna be a good day. I had to remind myself that my voice mattered, right? That was me decolonizing this morning. No, as an Afro-Indigenous queer fat femme, you matter. Your voice matters. What you have to say matters. And the people in the room with you, they also matter, right? We're all in community with each other now. That's also decolonizing. That when I leave here today, it's gonna to be more than just me speaking with you all. We are now in community with each other. I've shared my vulnerability with you in my story and you've shared your vulnerability by sitting here and listening, right? Decolonizing looks like community. It looks like now the next time I stand up in front of folks and I see familiar faces, I can feel like I belong again because I've seen you, I've shared community with you, right? We are in this partnership of society together. So people often ask me, okay, what, what does decolonizing really look like? How do we actually be in solidarity with each other? And I'm gonna say it's real simple. Just treat each other with respect. Recognize the humanity in each other. That's how you show solidarity. That's the very basis of solidarity is recognizing the humanity in each other. Oftentimes racialized and indigenous folks are dehumanized. We're seen as less than, or we're myths. There's all of these stereotypes that happen around us and we stop being people. And we start being, like I said earlier, those statistics on paper. We start being those stories we see in the news. We start being people who are incarcerated at higher rates. We stop being people. I stop being Shanice. The second you stop seeing my humanity, right? So solidarity looks like that. It looks like looking around the room and saying, I see you. I see your humanity. I honor who you are. Now past that, that very basic start is educating yourself. Like I said, we're on Algonquin territory. What does that mean? What did this land look like prior to Ottawa being here? What did the connection to the river mean prior 
to it being somewhere where we can skate in the winters. Right? Even Carlton, this land that it sits on, what did it mean to people prior to the university being here? It means spending time with actual Algonquin people. Past the TED Ed talk, though I do recommend watching TED Eds. But past that, have you taken time to go up to Kitagon Zibi to spend time with Algonquin people, with other indigenous people? There's a huge Inuit population here in Ottawa. Have you spent time with Inuit folks? We talk about overrepresentation, the overrepresentation of indigenous people being houseless. Are you treating them with humanity? Are you seeing them and seeing them as human? That's decolonizing. It's past being in academic spaces or corporate spaces or nonprofit spaces. It's walking down the street and seeing an indigenous person and treating them as human. It looks like learning the original place names. It looks like taking the time to understand what your relationship is to indigenous people on these lands. When we're talking about decolonizing our relationship to black folks on these lands, it looks like also educating yourself on that. Despite what a lot of people believe, Black folks have been on these lands for over 400 years. I know growing up, I really thought Black folks only came in the 60s and 70s, right, when we had that influx of a lot of Caribbean migrants. But Black people have been here for over 400 years, also in relationship with Indigenous people, right? So educating, educating yourself looks like, what does that relationship look like? If you are a racialized person coming to these lands, looking at other relationships between indigenous and racialized people, what does that look like? Learning about that and finding ways to fit into that, to honor that in your own relationship to indigenous peoples to these lands, right? Decolonizing does not simply look like looking at reconciliation from a white settler and indigenous perspective. What does it mean to be queer on these lands in relationship with two-spirit folks, right? I've heard a lot of queer people say, well, we've always been here. Indigenous queer people have always been here. And so what does that mean, right? Yes, queerness have, has always been on these lands, but it's looked a different way. All of our intersecting identities can be related to each other in different ways. It has to go past simply, again, a land acknowledgement. It's doing it in concrete ways. It's building relationships and kinships and honoring that, right? And challenging the systems that disrupt those relationships. It looks like also challenging the government, right? It looks like taking up space. It looks like the next time there's an event in this space, there's more Algonquin people, right? The next time I'm in a space like this, I wanna see at least 15 hands go up, at least at a minimum, right? It has to be more, we have to do more. And I know it seems like we've been doing a lot around decolonizing, but it has to be really about dismantling. It's not just about reintroducing indigenous ways of thought or racialized way of thought or black feminist theory. It means dismantling the systems and rebuilding things that are real for all of us, that create space for all of us, right? It's easy to simply hire one indigenous person, one black person, one queer person and say, ah, representation, ah, we've decolonized. Right? That's really easy. A lot of people do that. I always say I'm the Swiss army knife of the equity world. <laughs> I'm indigenous, I'm black, I'm queer and I'm fat and I'm a femme. Fit it all. But I can't be the only person you hire. Though I will say it's nice to be hired, but I can't be the only person, right? Diversity has to look like more than just that, more than just simply putting a face in a place. 
again, it goes back to dismantling those systems and creating new things. So while I started off this saying that, you know, I'm not meant to be here. Yes, within the colonial system, I'm not meant to be here. But when I think about all of the things my family has endured, when I think about my grandma and my mom being on these lands as indigenous people, when I think about my black grandmother coming to Canada, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I am meant to be here. In the same way that you are all meant to be here through all the sacrifices that your families have made, through all the efforts they have made. Every single one of us is meant to be in this room right now. The next time you speak, the next time you are doing a presentation, you are meant to do that, despite what the system says, right? Because we already know that's not really meant for us. But the work that was put in for us to get here today, we're right where we're supposed to be. I'm right where I'm supposed to be. So I wanna end with a quote from Malcolm X. And it says, when I becomes we, even illness becomes wellness. And that's what I think about when it comes to solidarity. We all here today are coming together. We are taking the I out of illness and putting the we into wellness. So I hope as you move through the rest of the day, you think about that, the we in all of this, the fact that we are all in community together today. And I just wanna say Chimi Gwich, thank you very much Marcy for listening to me today. And I hope you have a very eventful and educational day. Thank you. So I am sure that you all understand now why I was so excited to have Shanice here. Your ability, I know you can hear me back there, to tell, to tell this, to tell your story and to educate us, but to also engage us uh, is, is beyond measure. So thank you so much. Um, and I hear the call as the leader of CanWatch uh, and as the host of this event uh, around engaging the people on uh, uh, from the land which we were on in these conversations. And certainly uh, for the next summit, we've already started to think about that and uh, we are committed and I am committed to making sure that that happens. Though it will not be here. I, I don't have an answer for my staff yet if I'm allowed to announce where it is, but hopefully by the end of the day, I can do a big reveal. We're very excited about the next conference in May. Um, so what are we doing now? We're going to go to a networking break. Please, again, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, I called on everyone to not let people stand alone um, and be on their own. So please have some conversations with folks that you have not had conversations with yet. Um, find someone new, new space, new place. From there, you have two options. There's concurrent sessions. If you want to hear more um, from Shanice, she will be running a workshop uh, in the conference room. So not in here uh, at 9:45 sharp. Uh, so please uh, head there. If uh, we also have those amazing knowledge spotlights taking place uh, here in this room, followed by a panel. Uh, so lots of quick hits of good deep information. Uh, so again, we're going to split up about hopefully half and half um, and have some good conversations. After that, you'll be sent off to grab your lunch. Really encourage, I see Chris Dandies is here. Hi, Chris. Um, so I really encourage you to grab your lunch and come back to this room so we can hear, um, uh, hear a good conversation with the minister and show him that, uh, yeah, we're, we're here to think about what he has to say, but also to, to ask tough questions. So come join us at 12, head off to your break and then your workshops next. Thanks so much.